what we've learned over the last few months is that people that have had prior infection with COVID-19 and have developed natural immunity, antibodies from natural infection, unfortunately are not protected against this new Delta variant, which is causing the number of the cases that we're seeing now. So prior infection, unfortunately, does not confer good protection against this Delta variant. The prior strain was different than this current strain, which is more virulent, transmits, transmits more readily, and so you will not be protected with natural infection alone. There's been a lot of questions about the safety of the vaccines because of the rapid timeline in which they received this emergency use authorization from the FDA. The important thing to recognize is that they still went through the same process of trials and study that other vaccines have in the past. There was some overlapping of the trials to allow some compression of that timeline, but the COVID vaccines have all had to go through phase one, two, and three trials to make sure that they were both safe but also effective before they receive this emergency use authorization. Following that FDA decision, they're still undergoing analysis. So there's ongoing study that's been continuing for these vaccines to make sure that they are still safe and effective for the people that have received them. At this point, we now have information or data beyond six months for people that received these vaccines in the early trials. And so they're still continuing to monitor that before they give their full approval, which is expected sometime this month or next. So I'm always concerned when someone says they'd rather take their chances with, with COVID-19 than the side effects from the vaccine. The side effects from the vaccine at this point are really well studied. We've, over 300 million doses have been administered in the United States. Side effects are generally very, very mild. They occur within the 48 hours of receiving the vaccine, usually more after the second dose than the first dose. And they tend to last for about 24, 25 hours before resolving. Sometimes people have some muscle aches. Sometimes they have a little bit of fatigue. Fever is less common. They tend to have soreness at the injection site, which is a good sign that your immune system is working. But those symptoms go away quickly. However, infection from COVID-19 can cause a lot of problems, and nobody plans to take the time to spend a week in the hospital for a mild infection uh, if they end up hospitalized, or even longer, if they're sick enough to end up in the ICU, they could be in the ICU for a month. Even if they don't get admitted to the hospital, they could have symptoms that last for you know, four or five weeks or longer if they develop the long COVID syndrome, and nobody wants to take time for that. So people do have symptoms from other vaccines that are commonly administered that we've been administering for years. Some of these vaccines cause more symptoms than others. Uh, we always hear about the flu vaccine. People can have some muscle aches, some arm soreness after the flu vaccine that they get annually. Again, that tends to be very mild, tends to be very short-lived, lasts for about 24 hours, similar to this COVID vaccine. The pertussis vaccine, the Tdap vaccine that people get, uh, pregnant women are recommended to receive each time that they're pregnant, um, tends to be a little bit more reactogenic or cause more symptoms with more muscle soreness. And this COVID-19 is probably similar to that in some degree. People tend to have pretty commonly some muscle soreness at the site of injection and some other mild symptoms, but they tend to go away pretty quickly, similar to the other side effects that we see with other vaccines that are commonly administered. So we're still learning about how transmissible a vaccinated person is if they get a breakthrough infection. It means they've received both doses or a full course of the vaccine. Two weeks later, they get an infection. How transmissible are they to other people? There was a study that came out relatively recently that shows that they can have viral loads that are similar to people that are unvaccinated. But what we're starting to learn is that they have a high viral load initially, but they have it for a much shorter time period. So they may have a high viral load similar to someone that's unvaccinated with COVID-19 infection if they're unfortunate enough to have a breakthrough infection. But it may only last for two or three days versus the person that's unvaccinated where they tend to have a transmissible viral load for up to 10 days, sometimes even longer if they're immunocompromised. So it doesn't look like there's the same ability to transmit to other people if you're vaccinated because they have that immune system response, those antibodies that are starting to work on the virus right away versus an unvaccinated person who has this unchecked viral load for a longer period of time. So they're able to potentially infect many more people for a longer period of time. Now that we're hearing about breakthrough infections, people have raised the question, should I still get vaccinated if I can still get infected? And the answer is a resounding yes. And we have a lot of information at this point that backs that up. The rate of hospitalizations and deaths in people that are unvaccinated is much higher. Um, and we're still learning about this impact of transmissibility to others. But it does seem that people that are vaccinated probably aren't as transmissible for as long if they're unfortunate enough to get infected. And then overall, if you look at the infections, we're still seeing those largely in people that are unvaccinated. Breakthrough infections do occur, but compared to unvaccinated people, they're still very, very rare. And there's a lot of CDC data for the entire 50 states, United States, showing that breakthrough infections still occur very rarely.
I think that concern gets similar to the question about, you know, are vaccines safe? How did they get approved so quickly? People are raising some questions about that. And I think it's good to ask questions about the vaccines, but it's important to look at credible sources of information. And it's also important to recognize that these vaccines have still gone through the same scrutiny. And actually, to some degree, these COVID-19 vaccines that have received authorization by the FDA in the United States are the most studied vaccines in probably history at this point. We also have quite a bit of experience with them. We've been giving them for months and months now. We've given over 300 million doses. But they all went through phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. These trials basically look at how it works to make sure that we avoid a vaccine that could make people worse and better. And then the phase two and phase three trials move into these placebo controlled trials. And that means that people that participated in these studies received either the vaccine or a placebo, and neither the person that received it or the physician that was monitoring them knew which they received. And that way we can monitor how they respond to the vaccine and if they get infected. And that's a good way to make sure that you're not having any bias in determining if there's safety problems or there's uh, efficacy problems, how effective it is. And so by using placebo controlled trials, you really get a good look at, does the vaccine do what we need it to do? And is it safe for people to receive? Because you can compare the side effects from the placebo arm and the vaccine arm to make sure you're not seeing any worrisome signals that need to be investigated further. Those phase three trials for all of the vaccines that are used in the United States really showed good safety and good efficacy. And so I think that's a real reassuring way to look at it. What we know about the Delta variant at this point is that it's the most virulent strain of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19 that we've seen yet. Uh, what we saw with the prior alpha strain is that a person infected with it could infect maybe two or three other people. With this Delta strain, we're seeing that they can infect maybe seven or eight other people. So either two to four times more infectious. What we see with vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people is again that breakthrough infections still can occur, but are very rare, less commonly occur. When they do occur, people that are vaccinated tend to have very mild illness. They may be asymptomatic and we detect it when they get tested prior to having a procedure in the hospital or they have mild symptoms where they don't need to be in the hospital or actually even go to the emergency department or urgent care clinics, which are all full right now. Unvaccinated people, unfortunately, tend to have very more pronounced symptoms, more severe disease. And we're seeing that based on the numbers of the hospitalizations and unfortunately the deaths that we've been seeing so far. And this big surge in the pandemic is really being driven by people that are unvaccinated. And so we have a lot of information at this point that shows that being unvaccinated really puts you at high risk, not only of getting the disease, but of transmitting to other people, being hospitalized and potentially dying from COVID-19. The real reason that we're seeing more younger people in the hospital with this Delta variant than we saw with the prior strains is that the level of vaccination uptake is much better in people that are older. When we look at our patients that were 60 and older, they were the first to be available, eligible to receive the vaccines, but they've also had the biggest uptake since the eligibility criteria has been extended to other age groups. Those older age groups are still the highest vaccinated. And so what we're seeing is that this Delta variant is so transmissible, it's going through the country pretty quickly, especially through unvaccinated people. But we have much more unvaccinated people, even out of people that are eligible for the vaccine in that age 12 to 60 year old age range, particularly that 12 to 30 year old age range. So we need to get more people vaccinated. The real reason we're seeing younger people now in the hospital is because more of those people are unvaccinated. We're still learning more about Delta and how much more severe the disease may be. But the bigger reason that we're seeing more children in the hospital now is because we're seeing more children get infected. Children under 12 are still not eligible for COVID vaccines at this point. And we're seeing that this strain of the virus, this Delta variant is so much more transmissible that more kids are getting sick. The other thing is that we also have seen a lot less of the public health measures that we were using initially in the pandemic. Less people are masking, more people are getting together, um, and we're not doing some of the other things that can help decrease transmission as well. And so that leads to more kids getting infected. Now, while overall, less ki kids have less severe disease than adults, if you have enough kids get sick, you're still gonna have a percentage of them end up in the hospital, and unfortunately, some are dying. And so that's what we're seeing is it's just a, such a large number of children being infected at this point with this really transmissible strain, this Delta variant, that's leading to more children being hospitalized. We're still learning more about this Delta variant. At this point in the United States and in our South Texas region, about 98.9% .9 of the circulating isolates are Delta variant. So we're getting a lot of opportunity to learn more about it. But one of the things that we're seeing with the Delta variant is that the incubation time is shorter 
And so instead of about five to six days from being exposed to getting infected, it's more like three to five days. And we're seeing the patients that have Delta variant have a higher viral load initially, and it tends to be up in this upper respiratory tract. And so we're seeing more nasal congestion early on, which is a pretty mild symptom. But unfortunately, when people are having that mild nasal congestion, they're already transmissible to others. Versus early on in the pandemic with the original strain, we were seeing more lower respiratory tract type of symptoms, fever, cough, and shortness of breath, symptoms that were a little bit more worrisome and so people sought care earlier. So one of the concerns with this Delta variant is that since people are having milder symptoms like nasal congestion, like they, they may see with seasonal allergies or maybe a, a common cold, they may be less likely to seek care. So we are seeing some difference in the clinical presentations. And at this point, with the high levels of transmission of COVID, if you have any acute symptoms, even if they're mild like nasal congestion, it would really be recommended that you go and get tested to make sure that you don't have COVID-19. One of the questions people have to have chronic seasonal allergies, and I happen to be in that, most people that live in South Texas long enough tend to have chronic seasonal allergies, is really looking at the acuity of the symptoms. So if these are the same symptoms that you've been having, it may be more related to your, your allergies. And if it's responding to antihistamines or the usual medicines that you take for seasonal allergies, then it may not be COVID. But if you're seeing some change or something new, these are warning signs that you might have something different because clinically it can be really difficult to tease out what you have. And if there's any doubt, you really should proceed with getting tested to make sure it's not COVID-19. Masks are still very, very effective, and that's a really important point. One of the things that kept us safe and protected before we had vaccine available was the use of masks. The variant, this Delta variant is more transmissible than the prior strains, but it's still transmitted the same way, it's still transmitted largely through large droplets. And so wearing the mask is a way that you can keep yourself protected, even if you're fully vaccinated. And that's really why you're seeing more of these recommendations now. If you're going to be in indoor spaces, even if you're fully vaccinated or in large groups of people, wearing the mask is an important way to protect yourself from getting these rare breakthrough infections. Or if you're unvaccinated, particularly important that you're wearing a mask when you're around people because you're putting yourself at risk if you're not using some form of protection. And the masks are still highly effective.